And we are officially live. What is going on, everybody? My name is Joe DeRosa for Buffalo Fanatics, and this is The Shout, which is live every Monday, usually at 1 p.m. However, today, we had some technical difficulties, and we also had the draft luncheon go on. Therefore, I had to start a little bit later today, so I do apologize for that. But I'm here right now. I'm in my usual spot. I got my program ready to roll, and we're ready to roll today. So I want to thank you all for joining me today because I have a lot of stuff to cover. Now, originally, I was just going to discuss the Bills receiving core, and I mean, I am still going to talk about that. But I also wanted to give you a little shenanigans, a little bit of my take on what we just watched, which was the draft luncheon. Rico, what's going on? I can't. Uh, why are you talking from your account? You're talking from the Buffalo Fanatics account. But either way, I am very excited to talk to you guys today. That draft luncheon was extremely interesting. Uh, it pretty much confirmed everything I was thinking that the Bills are going to be doing in the draft. I don't know if it did the same for all of you guys. So before I get into that, for those of you joining me today, for those of you watching right now, I would like you guys to do two things for me. Now, number one, click that link in today's title, and that is your song of the day. It is a song called Tomorrow by an artist named Callie Uchis. She is, in my opinion, amazing. I absolutely love her. She is an awesome vocalist who has really interesting music, and that song is produced by one of my favorite bands. So I think you guys should check it out. Very fun song to listen to, and I think you would like it. Now, number two, if you are joining me today, if you are watching my broadcast, I would like to ask you people, you lovely people of Buffalo Fanatics, I almost said boys, but I'm going to know there's some girls in the crowd too, to uh, comment in the comments below and tell me what you thought of the draft luncheon if you got to watch it, and if not, and tell me what you think the Bills should do in the draft, and what do you think of our receiving core? Because that's going to be the highlight of today's episode. What do you think of the Buffalo Bills receiving core? What do you think needs to be added? Do you think we should leave it the way it is? Do you think there's anyone that these people should go get? Tell me your opinion on it. I would be happy to respond to all of your comments at the end of the show today. But right now, let's talk about that draft luncheon real quick. So Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott addressed the media, took them head on. And as we all know, Buffalo media isn't exactly the most forgiving outlet in the world. They're pretty harsh with their questioning. But I thought uh, McBean, McDermott, Bean did a good job of covering it. They really answered everyone's question. And like I said before, they confirmed everything that I was thinking about the draft. Now, I have been a firm believer, if you've been keeping up with me week after week, that these guys are going to end up trading up in the draft. I don't know if they're going to end up going to number six. I don't know if they're going to go to number two at this point. I've said I would like them to give it all and go get their franchise quarterback, who I do believe is in this draft. But I think that they actually are going to trade up based on the answers that they just gave us. Bean made it a very clear point to say that you can't win without a franchise quarterback. He said that a franchise quarterback is pretty much the number one role of a general manager. To drop that bombshell and then dodge all these questions afterwards, to me, just speaks volumes about your draft movement. Now, again, the draft, everything going up to it, the whole process is filled with smoke screens. It's filled with charades. So for all we know, this team could end up trading down. We have no confirmation of anything until draft day happens or a transaction is made. However, I do think they're trading up, and I think their sights are set on either Baker Mayfield or Josh Rosen. Josh Allen, to me, is simply a smokescreen, simply a ploy to get people to think that they're going to go for him, possibly an attempt to get the Browns or another team to get him too early so that our potential franchise quarterback is still there. So I was a very big fan of the way Bean handled the presser, a big fan of the way McDermott handled it. He talked highly about his defense. He was very excited about Ryan Groy, which I know is something that we should be excited about too because everything happening with Richie and all this cryptic Twitter BS that happened, his retirement, whether he's going to end up playing or not. It was very nice to see McDermott speak so highly of Ryan Groy, talk about his leadership, talk about his potential, when he's probably going to end up being that focal point of our offensive line now. Now that pretty much all of the major veteran presence is gone, Wood's gone, Incognito's gone. Really, you need someone to step up and be that leader. I think Roy could do it since he was so great at center a couple years ago. He could do it now. So, again, very nice to see them talk about it. And please feel free to tell me what you think the Bills are going to do in this draft. As I said before, I think they're trading up. I do think that they're going to try and, at this point, maybe hit the middle ground, hit that 5-6 spot, and maybe not try to give up too much stock. But don't be surprised if these guys trade the farm. Like I said, Bean spoke highly of franchise quarterbacks. You think it's the most pivotal position on your team? I agree with him. So I think it's more than worth it to go get a guy you think is going to lead your team for years to come. I hope it's not Josh Allen. All right. 
So, as I mentioned before, today's topic is the receiving core. Today I want to talk about the Buffalo Bills receivers, what I think of them, really what I think should be done into the draft or even into the season with the time we have left before September rolls around. So, basically, let's give you a little background for those of you who are unaware. The Buffalo Bills receiving core in 2017 was nothing short than a wonderful disappointment. They finished 31st in the league in total receiving yards, total receiving offense, at least according to ESPN. And for all you know, 32 teams in the league being 31st is dismal. It's not fun. No one wants to have that position, and yet here the Bills are. Their offense was highlighted by Deontay Thompson, who was a journeyman receiver. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to badmouth Deontay Thompson. I love the guy. I thought he was a good deep threat for this team. I would have loved to have him back. I would have welcomed him back with open arms. If you watched my show last week, you know I really like Deontay Thompson, and I was sad that he went to Dallas. However, Deontay Thompson, notably at 30 years old, should not be the wide receiver one of your team when your team just trades for Kelvin Benjamin, when your team gave up Sammy Watkins, when your team drafted Zay Jones in the second round. I don't think he should have been the number one. Yet here we are, the 31st receiving offense. Deontay Thompson led our team with 474 yards on 27 receptions. That's not good. That's pretty damn bad in my opinion. And I'm sure most of you will agree. And now obviously the receiving core needs to step up from what was a very disappointing 2017 campaign. You can argue that Tyrod Taylor was the biggest contributor to their failure, but I think it was a mixture of Tyrod not working in Dennison's offense and Dennison's schemes just not favoring the receivers he had. And obviously this team doesn't have elite talent at the moment. I mean, Kelvin Benjamin really had one good season, but ultimately has proven that he's not been an elite receiver in his career. Could he be? I mean, I still think he could. He's a young guy. He's got all the talent in the world. And if he steps up this year and plays the season healthy, he could eclipse a thousand yards and show people that he still got plenty left in the tank and plenty to prove for this team, which would give us an extension eventually. But right now they really don't have an elite talent that has yet to prove themselves. So it looks like they're going to have to turn to the draft to try and find more talent, or at least maybe do a couple more free agent signings. And ladies and gentlemen, there was actually news this morning before my show. I don't think you understand. I was driving to campus today. I was absolutely hyped. We finally did a thing on the day of my show, and I can't believe it. I was dumbfounded. And hey, it's not big news at all. It's Jeremy Curley. It's not a big signing at all. Yet still, we added some depth to the receiver position, something I was glad to see. I like Jeremy Curley. I know he's not going to be a wide receiver one, but he provides some depth maybe at the slot, maybe making Zay Jones go to the outside more. I don't really know what their plan is with him. I don't know the contract figures yet. I haven't looked into it. All I know is Jeremy Curley's a Buffalo Bill, which makes today's talking point a little more interesting as we are talking about receivers. So that being said, let's take a look at some of the depth now that we add Curly to the mix for the Bills receiving core. In no order and no position order, we have Kelvin Benjamin, Andre Holmes, Jeremy Curley, Brandon Riley, Zay Jones, everyone's favorite training camp guy, Rod Streeter, Malachi Dupree, and Quan Bray. So if you could have named me three of those names last year, then I commend you. Now, Kelvin Benjamin is obviously our current wide receiver one, obviously. Dude's a big body. At the end of the year when he's healthy, he was proven that he really wanted to play, and he was playing on a torn meniscus. I think he had fairly decent production. Again, the offense didn't really cater to his knees. I think with Dayball now and a potential franchise quarterback or maybe A.J. McCarron starting, whatever they decide to do, he's going to get a lot more love. It also was on him to make sure that he is still healthy. Apparently, he's fully recovered from surgery, so... If that's the case, Kelvin Benjamin is your clear cut WR1 unless they decide to do something crazy. Now, they still have Zay. Obviously, we don't know what's going to go on with the discipline for Zay. Obviously, the Bills want him back, but we don't know if the NFL is going to do anything for him. If, he decide, if they decide that it's not a serious enough issue and he stays around, then Zay Jones will probably be in the slot. But you don't know. Maybe Curley will make him go on the outside. I'm not sure yet. It's still very new. Andre Holmes was very underwhelming last year, didn't really do much. At this point, all he has is his size, and I mean, we could tell the Bills want bigger receivers, so maybe we'll have more of a role if the, if the passing game gets a little bit better based on our quarterback, based on Dable's offensive system, but Andre Holmes was kind of underwhelming, so it's not a name I'm super excited about, but let's give him another year. Maybe he'll prove himself this year and have a nice season as a deaf guy. Now, Brandon Riley, this is a guy that I've been very excited for. I thought he should have gotten a shot way earlier last year. When he went to the roster but didn't start, I was disappointed. I wanted to see Brandon Riley play. Young guy, gritty guy. I think he's got good hands. I'm not sure about his speed or size, but I do know that he can make plays. And I wanted to see him in the offense. So I think we're going to get more of a chance to see him this year, considering that our resources are kind of depleted. So let's see what Brandon Riley can do. 
Now Jeremy Curley, as I mentioned before, probably competing for the slot position. He's not going to get you 1,000 yards. So, again, I only freaked out about the news because something actually happened on the day of the shout. Un unbelievable. Now, Rod Streeter, again, another guy that I was very excited to see last year. He was making insane plays in training camp. Looked like to be our deep threat for the season. Kind of a, a, a diamond in the rough, if you will. Gets hurt and doesn't get to start, so I was very disappointed about that. He's coming in with a chip on his shoulder. He's hungry, and hopefully he can last the entire training camp and be able to be there for us this year. I would love to see Streeter play. I would love to see him prove people wrong, shut some doubters up, and ball out this year. Will he? I can't say. I can't predict the future, but I would love for Rod Streeter to step up. His receiving core definitely needs it. And then Malachi and Dupree and Quan Bray. I'm not familiar with these guys, but I really don't know much about them. Again, I think these are more than likely training camp bodies. We'll have to see. I could be proven wrong. And I forgot to mention Kalen Clay. Kalen Clay is going to finally have an offseason under his belt to work with this team, and I think he can make some plays for us. I'm not 100% sure how good he will be. I know in Carolina he was stepping up a little bit, but this guy is obviously not an elite receiver either, so we're going to have to see. But if he has an offseason under his belt, I can't see why he can't be productive in this offense. He was slightly productive in this time before we cut him last season. So now, that's our receiving core. What do we do next? And there are a couple options here, but if we want to improve the receiving core, you can either turn to what's left in free agency and wait for training camp bodies to come into free agency or take who's there now or go to the draft. So right now, let's take a look at what's there in free agency in terms of notable receivers. And suddenly, Des Bryant appears. Now, I'm not going to give an opinion, or I should say, I'm not sure if this would be worth it. Because one thing is, Des Bryant has had good years in the past, but last year's campaign was very underwhelming. Again, you might be able to contribute that to Dak Prescott and the ineptitude of uh, Jason Garrett, but I still think Des Bryant is a talented receiver, but he does have health concerns. That combination might make his upcoming contract be fairly reasonable to a team that doesn't have too much cap space. And I've been reading that the Bills have been a sought-after destination spot for Des Bryant. People think he would work really well here. I agree with that. I think an all-purpose receiver would help this court tremendously. So I would really like Des Bryant to sign if it was for the rice, right price, the rice price. One year would obviously be the start. This team has proven that they don't really want to invest too much into a questionable character. They really want someone who, if he balls out, then they'll sign him long term. But if he has a question mark above his head, if they need him, they'll try to bring him in for a deal that will benefit both sides. But if he ends up faltering, then they can get rid of him. And I think that's what they would try to do for Des Bryant. So to me, if they were to offer him any sort of contract, I think they would give him at least a year, maybe like, I don't I don't even know, 10 million? Because I think Des Bryant right now is a huge question mark. He's 29 years old. He's had foot injuries in the past. He's coming off a down year. And he really hasn't been all that much of an elite. I mean, he really was an elite receiver for the past two years. So what is he going to do in Buffalo? But I think you can get him for a low enough price and give him a chance to prove himself alongside Kelvin Benjamin, alongside Zay Jones. You got other receivers too. McCoy out the backfield, Charles Clay. I think it would work well, but it's really a matter of if he wants to come to Buffalo. I don't know if he's going to want to, but this is just an idea for a receiving core that seems to need help. So now, if he doesn't want to come here, and we have no option for free agency, that obviously means that we're going to turn to the draft. Now, the draft has some interesting names this year. You have a couple of people that are projected to go in the first round, but ultimately it seems that the mid-rounds are going to be where most of the talent falls in the receiving, in the receiving aspect. And I think some people are getting undervalued. I mean, it's obviously not the best receiving class that we've ever seen, but there's still talent in there that I don't think should be overlooked. Now, even though we just signed a 5'9 Jeremy Curley, I still think the team believes in having bigger bodies in the receiving core, evidently by Kelvin Benjamin and whoever else they decide to sign. For me, I think they're going to be eyeing receivers that have size to them. And I think Many people in Buffalo Fanatics have been talking about this name, and I agree. I think he's really talented. I think he's fast. He's big, and I think he would work well in this offense. And that's DJ Chark from LSU. Dude, six foot two. I believe he ran a 4'4 at the combine or a 4'3. I don't quite remember, so someone would have to fact check me on that. But I think he would work really well in Buffalo's offense. Brian Dable would obviously work him well into the game plan. He could be a deep threat that's much needed on this team if they decide to just leave it for the draft to address that spot in the offense. So I want DJ Chark personally. I think he's an option in the draft. So who else we could go for? Auden Tate from Alabama. And I read that. Uh, excuse me. I started. Auden Tate, I believe, is from Alabama. And, you know, at six foot five, a receiver of that caliber is someone you would want in your offense, especially if he can move. He's not the fastest receiver in this class, but it's obvious that he can make plays on 50-50 jump balls. So I would want that in this offense because it would take a lot of pressure off some of our other receivers. Calvin Benjamin, you could take pressure off of uh, – 
sorry, Charles Clay, anyone else who decide to keep on the outside. Now, Equinemius St. Brown, who was six foot three and ran a four four. This guy is a freak. He's a freak athlete, and I would love if they got him. Again, Notre Dame didn't really have a good quarterback situation, so I'm not 100% sure if his stats were really a reflection of his play or a reflection of bad quarterback play. But I like St. Brown. I think he would work well in Buffalo, too, so that's an option. Simi Cobbs falling in at 6'3", ran a 4'4". Another option. I watched some of his tape. Dude can make one-handed plays and I think would work well. So really, all of these guys are big bodies. Please feel free to suggest me any receiver I might not have addressed. Again, I was trying to look for guys that really had size to them because that's just what I think they like in this offense. But they could go and surprise us and get someone who's you know 5'10", 5'11", 6 foot, whatever you feel. But they all have good to great speed. All of these guys would be additions to an offense that needs weapons. And to me, the Bills receiving core is a bit depleted. So at this point, you're looking to other resources to kind of bolster it. I do want to see some of the guys in camp who were there last year, who were in camp last year, kind of, you know, step up in this offense and prove themselves. Because Riley and Streeter specifically had, were the buzz of minicamp and the buzz of training camp. People were saying these guys could make plays when they were on the second team, even the first team. But, you know, injury or just, you know, being designated to the practice squad hindered that. So with that being said, I'm going to go into the comments right now and read a couple of things that you guys have said. Guys, feel free to chime in and let me know what you want to say. If it's about the receiving core, if it's about the draft luncheon, whatever you feel like telling me, I am here to read it. Let's go. Malachi and Riley was, well, we'll get a shot. No, no to Bryant, DJ Moore, Bryant 2.0, and Younger. Okay, so I don't really know much about DJ Moore, but I'll take your word for it if you're so convinced of him. Malachi and Riley, I do hope get a shot. I don't really know much about Malachi Dupree, so, I mean, he would have to tr prove himself in training camp to me. But Brandon Riley, like I said, I was really hyped about him last year. I thought he was going to be that diamond in the rough that could step in and do work just like Rod Streeter could. It's really a matter of if the team believes in him enough, and that's something where he has an interesting dilemma on his hands. He's a young guy. He's been in the system for a year. Now he's got to go in and prove that he can start in this offense. And, I mean, the thing about last year, too, was the quarterback play, especially when I was referring to this with people in college, but now in the NFL level, the quarterback play was definitely holding back some of our receivers, at least in my opinion, because I didn't think Tyrod worked too well in Rick Dennison's offense. So now if we have a competent quarterback behind center, I really do think that could elevate the play of some of the guys who were being gritty in camp last year. Brandon Riley is one of those names that comes up for me. So I would like to see him get a shot. I'm sure you would, too. So what else did he comment? DJ Moore, Anthony Miller, I really want Dallas go Derek tight end. I don't know if tight end's really on their sights. I think this team's okay at tight end now. Um, maybe in the later rounds if they decide to get someone, but ultimately with Charles Clay, Nick O'Leary, Logan Thomas, I don't think you need to go above and beyond that unless the prospect is absolutely stellar. I know Mike Gusecki was an option for a lot of people, but to me, I think tight end position's fine. I think you need to get some receivers and the tight end core just be left alone, personally, because Clay could still make plays. I know he has a somewhat of a dropping problem, but I still think he's kind of our called upon tight end. I think he'll do well if we have a good passer. Um, Nick O'Leary, I really like. I think Nick he runs great routes, and he always seems to be open. You know, Tyrod trusted him a lot last year, so imagine what someone who's a little more um, confident in his throwing, his midfield throwing, to do with him. And Logan Thomas, I still think, could surprise a lot of people. He didn't really get much action last year, but he's a big body, good red zone threat. So I think the tight end position's set right now. But, I mean, if they feel that someone is talented enough, then they're probably going to go for it. Do you see Miller and Dukas? You got this right at time, by the way, Rudy, because there was nothing else, so I'm glad you came in. Do you see Miller and Dukas as starter either side this year, or will we upgrade? You know, I want to see John Miller start. John Miller in his uh, second year was starting to step up and really prove himself a lot more. Uh, I don't think Dennison liked the way he worked in uh, his offense last year, which is why he didn't get a chance to start. But I think John Miller is slowly getting better. Obviously, a year removed from serious starting is going to affect his play, but I would like to see him play again. I really think he kind of got shafted just because it didn't he didn't fit here, but we still have him. So I hope Miller starts at the guard position, but I wouldn't be surprised if they move. And Dukas, apparently Dukas was our highest graded, which I didn't realize, or something along those lines. I'm not a big fan of him personally, but if he can play the position, then put him there. I think they have a lot of needs to address in the draft. I do want them to take a guard in the first round if they don't trade up. But right now, I think they're going to trade up, which will mean that all the good guards are going to be gone. So I think they're going to have to trust these guys. But if they stay put, maybe they'll draft another one to put ahead. So, yeah.
I see a thumbs up, so I like to appreciate that like. Guys, keep them coming. I'm still here. I still want to talk. I got plenty of time. I got all day. Got to say, it's been pretty terrible weather over here in uh, Connecticut. I was driving to campus this morning, and it was downpouring, and I'm wearing sneakers, so my feet got soaking wet. It's no fun at all. Really just weather's terrible here, man. It's so bad. I'm, I saw the um, – what do you call it? All the players walking in for OTAs too. And I just saw that they were like in the soaking wet. It's just, it seems like everywhere it's just raining, man. It's terrible. Pete Boniker, Ducas is trash. Yeah, again, I'm not a huge fan of him. Apparently he like had a couple of plays last year where he actually was stepping up. But for the most part, he was kind of like a turnstile. So I ultimately think Ducas is kind of their fallback if they can't get anywhere else. So let's see here. Oh, shout out to the Buffalo Fanatics boys for watching today. Again, I took Pierre's advice and decided to wait till after the draft luncheon. It was kind of a good idea. It gave me some talking points. You know, with the draft really close by, there still hasn't been any major announcements or any major news going on. So I've just really been trying to come up with the best topics I can. And receiving core was definitely one I wanted to talk about for a while. It's, it's unfortunate that this team doesn't have that much but again this year we're kind of in a bad position to begin with because i think we had more pressing needs that we needed to use our salary cap for d-line was one of the biggest and star to lele trent murphy those were big names that we needed to bring in so i understand why we didn't delegate a lot of money to go get a receiver and some of the receiving contracts were kind of overblown i mean sammy Watkins, i'm a defender of him but that was a ridiculous contract for him so i mean obviously every receiver who had at least somewhat sought after production last year was going to ask for a fair amount of money which the bills just didn't have and i think even though richie being gone is going to hinder us it did open up the cap space a little more and you saw them today they signed two players for depth so i mean hey maybe they could still go and get a receiver but at the point of the beginning of free agency i really didn't see them getting one it didn't seem like a point because they needed to address the d-line more in my opinion so yeah Hey, man, if you guys got no more comments or questions, then I guess I'm done here for the day. But I want to thank all of you who decided to tune in and check out this week's episode of The Shout. If you want to see more from me, if you want to see me go on some Bills rants or just follow me in general, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at show underscore DeRosa. I will be back next week with more to cover about the Buffalo Bills and whether they drive me crazy or not. We'll see. We'll find out. But thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Shout. For Buffalo Fanatics, my name is Joe DeRosa. I will see you all very soon.